Welcome back to Summer for the last time. You finally decided to move in the city that seems to be a safer place for many reasons. But is your new life so wonderful? Let's find out. When you arrive in the city, there are good chances that you will live in a district like this or like this. Let's focus on this one for a change, the one closer to the temple. You will probably not arrive on your own, rather with your whole family, that is, an extended family, your household. Your parents and siblings, of course, but also maybe your uncles and aunts, your cousins, the family of your elder brother if he's already married, and your grandparents if they are still alive. You would live all together in the big house or a series of neighboring houses. This means that your neighbors are members of your extended families, even though ties would get looser and looser as time passes by. As a consequence, the social network in those districts that goes together with mutual assistance that is helping each other was probably strong, which is an advantage. Do you have districts for rich people and districts for poor people? Difficult to say, and this would need to be further explored, but it does not seem so. In our district, you have both big and small houses together. Here, for instance, you have a huge house, while this one is rather tiny. This group here are quite equivalent in size. Looks like rich and poor people were living together, all together. But the households can also explain the difference between the, the, house, the, the size of houses. The principle was that the main house was divided between sons at the end of the father. The original house was quite large, like this one here, but after the division, what was left? And you can see here that the, the, the two shares are not exactly equal. It looks a bit unfair for the son who gets the smaller share, unless he in turn manages to enlarge his own house by buying the house of the neighbor, for instance. This means that those districts were extremely changing and flexible, but it also means that you can get richer or poorer in a lifetime. The society was very hierarchized, but it was possible to move on the social ladder very fast in both ways, up and down, which is a bit more problematic. Another thing that we know for sure, which is less positive, is that those districts were very crowded. We saw that already. And this raises one of the main issues in those districts, health conditions. No matter how you look at it, lack of water resources probably was a fundamental issue in the Sumerian cities. In the districts we've seen before, there is no canals or fountains where inhabitants could easily get water. In several houses, big jars were found in the courtyards, probably to store drinkable water during the day. But where do you get it? In the canals? At the rivers? Yes, but it was not close and not an insurance to find clean water, especially during the, season, the summer in the low water season. Sumerians were concerned about personal cleanliness, that is bathing and washing themselves. It is important for them to be pure, that is clean, when they go to the temple, for instance. But we do not know about public bath or anything of the sort. We do have evidence of bathroom, but only for some palaces. In Ur, the archaeologist recognized toilets and bathroom in the private houses because he found drains to evacuate waters in some rooms. They illustrate a concern to get rid of wastewater as some kind of sewers, but maybe simply rainwater and not just toilet waste. No, toilet, toilet waste. This leads us to another essential aspect regarding health conditions. What do you do with night soil? And what about animal dogs? They did not have dogs or cats as pets, but they did have pigs, goats, sheep, donkeys living in the houses. In general, what do they do with their rubbish? Some of you may have the image of the filthy medieval streets where garbage and night soil were thrown out of the windows. By analogy, we may assume that the streets were garbage dumps. It is a possibility, but in the end, you must get rid of it, especially in those climates. We can consider few possibilities. In the district, an abandoned house can serve as a rubbish pit, and we do know from the text that there were many abandoned houses in the middle of the city. There were some rubbish pits in the city. One was excavated in Ur, and archaeologists will probably find more of them at the city edges. In northern Mesopotamia, finally, in Telbrak, a small mound close to the city actually was a huge rubbish dump. 
This last option well exemplifies that at some point rubbish needs to be disposed of as far as possible from the city centre, which is common sense. Some people must have been appointed for the job. It is probable that it was not a permanent job, rather a duty people undertook to turn. Finally, when we consider waste disposal in ancient Sumer, we must seriously consider reusing and recycling and repairing. Sumerians were excellent at that. One last thing to remain healthy. Food! What about Sumerian diet? What was on the menu? Wheat and barley were the daily meal base. We know from the text thousands of kinds of flour and almost hundreds of bread variety. Next to that, with the marshes and the sea so close to them, Sumerian seems to have been excellent fishermen, and all kinds of fish were on the menu. We know they were also eating pork and sheep, probably less often though, and beef was extremely rare, probably a treat. Dairy products were also important yogurt, butter, cream, cheese. They also have ducks and goose and their eggs. Vegetable, herbs and spice were crucial in the diet. Garlic, onion, cucumbers were probably the trifecta. Chickpeas, leeks, coriander, cumin, beans, etc. As for the fruits, dates are by far the most common ones and many figs and pomegranates. For vo both vegetable and fruits, many remain unknown to us. We know their Sumerian names, but we have no idea which vegetable or fruit hide behind them because they are never described in the text. For instance, the gazi plant and the rush of food are mentioned everywhere. There have been many suggestions for them, but none is entirely satisfying. Still lots to do about those. Even if you eat well, are careful with your water and get rid of your rubbish, falling ill would, would unfortunately occur quite often. What do you do then, knowing of course that medicine has nothing in common with our well, you pray and hope. Uh, diseases were understood as the striking or the gripping of a god. Hence their names as Hand of God, like you see here. The Hand of Nergal, that's the name of the, the disease, has seized me. That means that they say, instead of saying, I caught a cold, they said the cold has caught me. As a consequence, reciting incantations were essential to warn, to warn the diseases of Next to that, they had many plant and stone-based medications, as in most ancient and traditional societies. Of course, it is impossible to say for us to say how efficient those were. There were some professional healers as well, to whom Sumerians could turn to. Finally, there is a place where, uh, where people might have found comfort when they got sick, temples of the medicine goddess Gula. She had a temple in every city, some were excavated. Many fi figurines were found in there. People used figurines to show the goddess where they were hurt or injured. When they were cured, they were offering a dog to the goddess. The dog was a pet. Having access to the temple of Gula may have seen, been seen as another advantage of the city life. So in the end, what do you think? What is your opinion? Was it so horrible to live in a Sumerian city? Of course, things were not perfect. Many issues probably were health conditions, crowding, and access to drinkable water, but next to that, the city offers some kinds of safety net, a social network, and job, or job opportunities, amongst others. And lastly, something I have not yet mentioned, festivals. There were many bank holidays in Sumer, and many festivities in honors of the gods. Music is essential, according to the text. We know of animal tamers and wrestling performances. Performances seem to have been much appreciated. Sumerians all knew how to have fun. This concludes our journey in the Sumerian cities. Hope you enjoyed it and thank you for your attention. If you would like to know more, here are a few readings for children. You can also visit the forum on Esagil website to get a better idea of what you may find in the cities of Ur and Eridu, for instance. Enjoy your trip and hope to see you soon in Sumer.